ago. The court would not be in the same position, obviously, in terms of what to do with these statutes that I believe are in many ways conflicting. Because let's assume for the moment that we didn't have the uh, 3051 statutes, we didn't have the court's discretion with, with, with its ability to strike the enhancements, this wouldn't be much of a discussion, in all honesty, would it? Um, the people would be asking for the max, and it would be extremely difficult for the defense to ask the court legally to do anything. But that's not the status of the law today, and, and, I, and I impress that upon the court to say that the idea that somebody who is 25 years or under has a different sentencing scheme than somebody who is over that age is where we are in the law and what that means in terms of ultimate culpability. And unfortunately for the court, it's on the court to decide what that is. And so, to be perfectly frank, I put it in the sentencing brief in that way because if a traditional factor in mitigation is what was the age of the client, right? And over here we have, now we have all these other laws that codify that concept in terms of what Mr. Ariza's ultimate rights would be for a parole hearing, then I think this sentencing, unfortunately for the court in a lot of ways, is an exercising of what we do with these laws and how that works. Let me put it this way. Can the court sentence Mr. Arise to 40 to life? I believe the court has the legal authority to do that, obviously. But when we have a law that comes in that says, hold on, we have to factor in his age. We have to factor in these things because the sentencing scheme is different. So does the 40 to life sentence for the court become largely academic at that point? And at what point, if it's a 400 year sentence, hypothetically speaking, and he's eligible for parole at 25, at what point, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination making a cruel and unusual punishment argument at this point, but we can see at some point if the law is saying, look, we have to recognize the age of the client. At what point does the sentence over what the law contemplates simply become academic? And so that's why I put it where I did. With respect to non-statutorily eligible for probation, I believe that it is my ethical obligation to ask for that. And I believe that there is an unusual circumstance argument that I think that the court can certainly deny. But I think from where I'm standing on behalf of Mr. Aris, I think I'm, I'm obligated to make that pitch. But legally, I just want to make sure the way I read the law is that if uh, the court in exercise its discretion under 1203 22.53, which the law has changed, the law has changed. Uh, we had legislation that uh, says the court is under a duty to uh, consider dismissing or striking that enhancement. Whereas we know that the law before that was that was a prohibition very similar to a person that was suffering a serious strike. My question is, court can't get to a consideration of probation until and only if the court dismisses the enhancement under 1202.53 because under 1202.53 the H section don't dismiss it, I don't strike it, the defendant is statutorily ineligible for probation. So I, that's why I'm trying to establish that. What the decision is here is whether the court should dismiss the enhancement that the jury found is true for the uh, use of the gun causing the death of this uh, child. 
Understood, Your Honor. And I understand the dynamic that the court's faced with. And it's also in light of these new laws that we have that situation, right? Because if we didn't have his age as a factor, and we didn't have what the law is saying is that, well, regardless of what the court does, he's eligible for parole at 25, uh, 25 years of service, right? Now, that's part of the court's analysis because if the court strikes the enhancement, we are left with probation or we're left with 15 to life on the second degree. I, I, the reason I'm saying that, I think it's, in everybody's interest that what the court does today is doing what the legislature has required the court to do. I think the last thing people want is that conditional remand because we didn't dot the I's and cross the T's. So that's why and this is the court's analysis. To me, it is these legal provisions that you've cited, the court can consider, but the court actually isn't required to. If the court does, the court gives it the weight it deems appropriate. And then second, to get to even a consideration of probation, the statutorily presumptively ineligible, the first thing that has to happen is for the court to dismiss the enhancement that you asked the court to do under 1385. I, I just want to make sure that we're all in agreement. That's where we are, and we all have our lanes. We all have to make our decisions, and uh, in a few minutes here, there's going to be what can only be said a very significant decision that the court has to make. And I just want to make sure, as officers of the court, uh, your advice that the court is proceeding the way that the court should do, especially in light of recent legislation that tells, as you suggested, or to focus on various factors such as age and childhood trauma. So I just put that out there because I want to make sure that the court is following the law. So go ahead. Uh, and I do think that's the court has absolutely outlined where we are. And I do stand by the position that the appropriate sentence here is to strike the enhancement for the number of factors that I have included. The childhood trauma issue is one of those factors. But in the defense brief, I've also alluded to a number of other mitigating factors. And this is also under the guise of the fact that the people have not alleged any aggravating factors whatsoever. So all the court has is the mitigating factors. But they're, because it's a determinate, indeterminate sentence, they're not required to allege aggravating factors. That's correct, they're not. They're not. Just as the court's not required to follow through with the defense request. But it doesn't mean that, that from the defense position that the request is what I think is the right thing to do. The people have talked about punishment. Nowhere at no time has Mr. Hurry said that he should not, and he's not willing to pay for what he's done. He absolutely understands that and has understood that from the very beginning. The people talk about the benefit of time, inferring that somehow that Mr. Harris could come up with something. And I submit to the court that from the very beginning, as I talked about in my brief, when he found out what actually happened, what the result was from his actions, he expressed remorse at the very beginning when he went to speak to uh, who ultimately was the co-defendant in the case. First opportunity he had to speak to the police, he gave a full confession that the court heard. 
there was never an excuse for Mr. Arias, ever. In fact, just the opposite. When the police pressed him to have an excuse, he said, I don't have one. <clears throat> and it's important for the court to consider that the benefit of time that the people allude to was used by Mr. Arias to continue to tell exactly what his truth was that he made a horrible, horrible mistake. He owns it. He's owned it since the beginning. And in his introspection letter, the court can hear that he's not making any excuses today. He's perfectly willing to accept whatever the court gives. And I think that's a very important point to make. As his advocate, I am making a position in terms of what I think the court should do and what I think is the right thing to do. Because the reality is, is if you give Mr. Arise 15 years to life, or you give him 40 years to life, the pain that the victim's family suffered doesn't change. Mr. Arise understands that pain. And he will be reading another statement that addresses some of that. And so I understand the court's position. In light of the new law, I'll just summarize the defense position as this. In light of the new law where we recognize the dynamic of the human condition in terms of what trauma does to you, when we recognize that a 24-year-old making an act is different from a cerebral concept than somebody who is perhaps 40 or 45 or 50, the law is recognizing that. And so the defense position very simply is, if the law is saying that a person of this age is parole eligible at 25 years, the defense position very simply is that the sentence should not go above that. And I think, from my perspective, I always want to try to convince the court, and I understand the uphill battle here. And from the defense <clears throat> position, when I see somebody like Mr. Aris, when I first met him, one of the things that I look at is watching these men and women become institutionalized and hard. And I am amazed that Mr. Arise has not done so. He's still as nice of a guy as when I first met him. His goodness is infectious, never bitter, totally <coughs> accepting of the court. It's extraordinary to see. Mr. Aries is an incredible artist, and he draws pictures. And he drew me a picture yesterday that he gave to me. And he explained the picture to me, and I won't share it with the court, but what he explained is that the way he drew the picture was that it was to cast out bad spirits. So for Mr. Aries, it wasn't, I want to wish you luck in the sentencing, because that would arguably come back to me being successful for him. That's not what he was wishing me. What he was wishing me was, the bad spirits go away. And so, as much as I'd like to try to think that I'm a good enough attorney to tell the court something that's going to impress the court enough to agree with me, I think that perhaps Mr. Arise's uh, final statement is probably the best way to do it. So, with the court's permission. Mm -hmm. I would like to start by saying that Aiden looks like a such a beautiful, precious, sweet, and happy little boy. He was a son, a little brother, and a friend to others. He looked as if he brightened up the world everywhere he went, and truly one of God's little angels. And I am so sorry for ever hurting him and for the pain that he went through because of me. He never deserved it and neither did his family. Miss Clunan, I am truly sorry for taking your beautiful son away from you. And there are no words for us. <coughs> Deeply and truly sorry I am for, <coughs> excuse me, for parting you and your son, or putting you and your son through so much pain. And not only you and Aiden, but your entire family has to suffer this heartache and pain because of me, and for that I am extremely sorry. 
Every night I pray for Aiden and your family. I know the burden and pain that you carry will never change, but I pray that God will help you with how you carry it and that you may find peace and happiness again. I'm so sorry, Miss Clinton. I also want to apologize to everyone else. Not only did I victimize the family, but I feel I victimized the first responders, the hospital staff, the investigators, the DA, my entire defense team, the judge uh, and the jury, and my family, and Winnie and their family, or Miss Lee and their family. I'm so sorry for putting everyone through this. None of you deserve to see this, but I put you through it. The effects of my actions have spread to everyone like dropping a rock in a pond. And I hurt everyone around me. I affected everyone in some way. Whether it be big or small, it doesn't change the fact that I am responsible for everyone's trauma, heartache, pain, and suffering. And for that, I am also deeply sorry. No words to you would alleviate your pain or, or soften your hearts to me. So I will end by saying this. Dear Lord in heaven, forgive me. As I stand before this court today, accountable for the terrible road I have chosen, I know that one day I will also stand before you, Lord, still accountable to you for my actions in this world. Lord, I pray you will carry Aiden's family in your loving arms every day. Open their eyes to your grace. Give them peace. I pray you stay with me also every day. I pray, Jesus, that you will not stop looking for me, your lost sheep. I have strayed so far away from you, and I need you to guide me back home. Lord, I beg forgiveness. I pray, let me appraise your name for Aiden's life every day of what's left of mine. And in Jesus' holy name, my life is in your hand. Amen. Anything further on behalf of the defense? Smith. All right, Mr. Feldman, uh, I'm going to allow you to comment. Uh, the defendant did make an additional statement. Uh, uh, I had him go first and let you comment on that. And so the court is going to allow you to comment if you so desire. We'll go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I don't need to repeat anything I've said. Um, I think we can uh, just look at it for what it is. Violent felony, jury's finding, statutorily ineligible versus on the other side what is clearly a sincere apology and a prayer but what we're talking about is the fabric that holds us all together which is following the rule of law and I think the courts laid it out I think the law is very clear I think the weight to be given to any doctor's note is in the court's hands and, and we fully trust in that but in this situation there is no legal there is no other justification outside of that that would justify the striking of the gun enhancement. Unless the court has questions, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Any concluding comments? Can you have your comment? No. All right, the court will now uh, move to sentencing. Um, the uh, first thing that the court is going to do is uh, uh, go through the uh, the fines, uh, and this is uh, required in every case. The court is going to impose a $40 court operation fee and a $30 uh, criminal conviction assessment fee on both counts one and two. The court is also going to impose a $300 uh, state restitution fund fee, and the court is also going to impose a $300 revocation fine, the latter is stayed pending successful completion of either probation or parole uh, if that were to occur. Um, with respect to the credits, um, the sentencing report does indicate dates up to today and the court indicates that it will then put in the abstract or in the minute order 1,042 days of actual time as what was pointed out by the people uh, because of the conviction of murder there are no conduct credits uh, would the defense agree with that all right on behalf of the people do you have to take issue at all with the number of days of actual time in custody no 
All right, now let's go to the, uh, uh, the next area, and that is restitution. Uh, the probation department said to be uh, submitted later. However, uh, did the people did uh, submit a restitution order, and I think that has to do with uh, reimbursement of victims' compensation fund. Am I correct on that? Yes. Is uh, there any uh, other restitution other than what uh, you have put in the restitution order? We have reached out to both Aiden's father and mother, and they both declined any further restitution. Well, what the court's going to do, uh, my tentative is to execute the restitution order as submitted and reserve jurisdiction in the event that there is further restitution having to do with the impact of the crime. Uh, any issue with that on behalf of the defense? No issue. Okay, now we go to uh, the actual sentence. Actual sentence. Uh, the first thing that the court should do is to uh, impose the sentence on count one. Uh, the court uh, at this point in time will impose 15 years to life on count one, which is the uh, punishment authorized by the statute. The court will now go to the enhancement. And as I've uh, attempted to articulate, if the court dismisses the enhancement, the court then goes back and determines if uh, the defendant is statutorily eligible. And I will revisit the sentencing on count one. So the issue for the court today, and I think everybody has agreed, is whether the court, in its discretion, should strike the additional 25 years to life under 12022.53. Uh, the court uh, in that has considered the defendant's statements, considered the uh, report that was authored uh, by the uh, doctor that was uh, submitted to the court yesterday. Uh, I've uh, considered uh, the fact that uh, the report does indicate childhood trauma I've also considered the fact of the age of the defendant. And before I get into the final decision, I'm assuming, as the people brought out, <clears throat> the court is making the uh, report of the doctor as part of the sentencing so that this constitutes a Franklin hearing. And the defendant has had the ability to set forth the factors in the event that that becomes <clears throat> important in the future. But I just wanted to make sure, are there any other information in terms of the Franklin hearing that the court is required to conduct at this time because of the age of the defendant at the time of the sentencing, at the time of the offense? The only defense request I have specific to the Franklin issue is that there is some law that indicates about what the defense ability uh, to reintroduce Franklin factors after the court sentence as we're going to our parole hearing. And I would simply ask that if new information that is available um, that defense retains the, uh, the right to introduce that to the extent that the law allows that, I don't think that's really a concern for the court today. But other than that request, no. All right, you've made the record on that. Do you wish to be heard on that? No, you're not. Thank you. All right, so now let's get to the, uh, the factors that the court has considered in exercising its now discretion to whether to dismiss, strike the 1222.53. Uh, uh, as I've indicated, I've, uh, I've taken into account uh, what has been reported is the childhood trauma of the defendant. I've taken into account the age of the defendant. I've taken into account also the defendant's statement here. Uh, I cannot, I just cannot draw a connection between the childhood trauma, the, what has been uh, reported about the uh, lack of development of frontal lobes of individuals at that age, as well as his age, and in, in looking and reading and presiding over this case, this defendant 
didn't commit any crimes until this particular day. He didn't. He's driving on the freeways. He's being subject to, I think, what we all see every day. And there was no impulse other than on this particular day. And I, I just can't connect that in this case, that his childhood trauma or his age was a factor in the commission of this crime. We have a six-year-old in the back seat, the most vulnerable victim that you can even imagine going to kindergarten being driven by his mom. And she, the mom, did some driving maneuver that caused girlfriend to give the peace sign that caused the mom to flip off. And that caused you to get behind the car. And in that particular moment, you had the power. And the power was that handgun. And whether it was to impress your girlfriend, to release your anger, you fired. And that little boy died. When all is said and done, that's what happened in this case. I cannot, as a sentencing judge, look at the facts and circumstances of this case and see any, either any stretch of the imagination, a non-legal justification such as being provoked or anything other than I'm going to get back at it. And that's what happened. And as the people have brought out, and there's a case uh, that the, our United States Supreme Court decided almost 30 years ago called Payton versus Tennessee. And what is an aggravating factor of a crime is victim impact. I don't think the English language can even attempt for anybody to even describe what Aiden's mother went through after he said, ouch. She pulls over and her little boy dies in her arms. I don't think anybody, anybody can even comprehend what the rest of her life is going to be about how her little boy died. The court places great weight on that aggravating factor that I'm allowed to do. And as a result, the court, in exercising its discretion, will not dismiss the enhancement. The court will impose 25 years to life consecutive to the 15 to life for count one for a total of 40 years to life. With respect to count two, I'll ask the people. I do agree with the defense. I think the people also uh, perhaps share in that, that it is merged pursuant to Penal Code Section 654. Would you agree? I do, sir. So the court is still required to impose a term. The court will impose and follow uh, the, uh, uh, the 1385 now because there was not a submission of factors of aggravation having to do with count two. Am I correct on that? On you are, people. All right. So the court then, in exercising its discretion under the California Rules of Court, will impose the midterm. Of, uh, on that, and the court will also impose the 25 years to life.
life, but it will run, it is merged pursuant to Penal Code Section 654. Now, before I get uh, to the final uh, order to the sheriff, I do want to ask, uh, as the courts happen, does the people see any sentencing errors that the court has made in terms of the imposition of the sentence? No, Your Honor. On behalf of your client? Yeah. If I can have just a moment. Sir, I need to address you. Um, you have a right to appeal the sentence of the court. Uh, and this is very important. I need to know that you understand this. Uh, it is your responsibility to file the notice of appeal. You must do so within 60 days. It must be filed with the clerk of my court here. It is your responsibility, I'm sure you discuss that with your attorney. If you do file a notice of appeal, the appellate court will do two things. They will appoint an appellate lawyer for you uh, at no charge, and you will also be provided a transcript of the necessary proceedings. What's important, and I want to make sure you understand this, is that it is your responsibility, and your attorney can do it, but it's your responsibility to file the notice of appeal within 60 days. Understand? Do you have any questions? No, Your Honor. All right. Anything further on behalf of the defense in terms of the sentencing or the notification of the appellate rights? No. On behalf of the people? No, Your Honor. All right. The sheriff at this time is ordered to transfer the defendant forthwith to the Department of Corrections. Of course, in recess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three years, but he's going to serve for 40 to life. So that will be subsumed. Uh, technically, that is 40th year, but there are other laws that are much too more complicated for me to go beyond this. Uh, yeah, can you grab this? Okay. 